Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and we are delighted that you have tuned us in and welcomed us into your home. You're an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you today during our live broadcast. So give us a jingle at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling us and you're outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205 271 2980 and you can always send us an email Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. Well today we have a lovely beautiful young couple. They are Kevin and Lisa Cotter. They are Catholic authors, speakers, podcasters. Don't they sound so young to be podcasting yeah. out there? Lisa has a beautiful website. It's called madetomagnify.com and Kevin works with Focus so you can get in touch with uh, Kevin at focus.com and they're going to ta be talking about beautiful subject they work with college age kids how to kind of hit the reset button in in life calling us to live holy excellent yeah. don't we want to be yeah. excellent Catholics um, and so they're really going to help us in areas of dating yeah. Um, in the formation of being all that God has called us to be and not compromising to the sexually saturated culture They've of this They've written a book world. called Dating Detox. Anybody need a detox from dating and false sexuality and relationships? 40 days of perfecting love in an imperfect world. You're going to want to hear all about it. I wanted to share a little bit today about my wogging, which is walking and jogging. The most faithful walking and jogging so I man. I walk and I jog, you know, just as I can do whatever. In my community, in our community. And uh, so over these years of, you know, 40 years of doing this out in the community, you meet a variety of people. And in this one part that I jog through, there's a woman who is so neighborly. I mean, she really knows what's going on. With, with people in the community. She's not a nosy, busy body gossip. She's not a nosy Josie. No. She really is a keeper of the neighborhood. Yeah, she's like a deaconess. Mm -hmm. she's, she's pastoral care. Mm -hmm. So she informed me the other day that someone who I'm acquainted with, a, a local pastor, had gotten seriously ill and shortly thereafter died rather suddenly. Mm. And so I jog past his house every day, pray for him, and... Uh, this is the second pastor in the neighborhood that's died. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, uh, well, if you, you live around long enough, people mm -hmm. are dying. And so I was asking her about somebody else as well. And so she says, there's so many people dying, I can't get to find out about other people. Mm -hmm. But thank God somebody's doing that. That's just the first word, neighborliness, caring for our neighbors, looking after one another. Thank God there's somebody like this in our community. So this, this reverend who passed away, um, I met him when I was serving as a minister in another tradition, and we got acquainted, and then I moved up where he lives, we moved there, and he has a daughter among his children that uh, is in a wheelchair and I don't know what the disability is I would guess muscular dystrophy she's late teens maybe early 20s so I got to know him just jogging by and watching him work at his house not as a minister but as as working at his house always sweating right. and you know, I see him the way the congregation doesn't see him mm -hmm. caring for his kids caring for this this uh, young girl who I met some time back but I had forgotten her name the neighborly lady told me her name, mm -hmm. which was good because on my way back, the girl was out getting ready to go into this van that takes her out for her day. She's in a wheelchair, the thing opens up and she goes to it. So she reminded me of her name, let's say Julie. And so from the distance, I said, Julie, Julie, because I wanted to express my condolences mm -hmm. to her. So I said, you know, walked up to her and she's in that wheelchair. And I said, I'm so sorry, you know, about your dad's passing, your father's passing, I'm so sorry. And I said, uh, he was a good man, and he was a really good man. I was bending down to her because she could barely kind of move around, but every time I've seen her, she just has such strength. And so, you know, I expressed this, your dad's a good man. And all she said to me, she looked up into my face, this girl who I'm sure the father's cared for from the moment of her birth and has cared for her so much, constrained to a wheelchair, how many years? And when I said he was a good man, a really good man, you know what she said? Surely he was. Mm -hmm. Three words. Surely, he was. And man, the privilege of just looking into her face, and that's all she had to say. Surely, he was. And just like mm -hmm. all the years, all the care. May that be said about us as mm -hmm. men. When our time comes to leave this earth, maybe suddenly, that your children would say about you, if somebody said, you know, your dad was a good man, he's a really good man, and that your daughter can look up in, your, in the eyes of that person and say, 
surely he was because this man may have ministered to tens of thousands of people mm -hmm. if your kids can't say my dad was a good man you're in trouble on that judgment day so let's all get it together as best we can as men as husbands and as dads that the witness from our family would be he was a good man. Mm, it was beautiful. I'm glad you got to, you know, you're running around and you had a heart attack, you know, three years ago. Yeah. And, you know, you couldn't, have, you would be missing from that community. That's yeah, a whole other story. Yeah, but, you know, it would be the joy show. No, this <laughs> no, it would be bad. The deal is, is, you know, every day, especially as we're coming into Lent, you know, we're getting ready for Ash yeah. Wednesdays, we make that journey. Cherish, love all the people that you can. Keep your account sh uh, very short. Forgive and forget. Choose not to hate and remember and love well as we Amen. prepare our hearts for Lent. Well, the Carters are here with us. Dating Detox, they're going to share about. And as they share about that, I wanted to mention as well the Umane Vitae study guide that I worked on and wrote and with others. I was the editor for that. And uh, if this all gets down to sexual relationship to the transmission of human life and the vessel that holds it, marriage, as we come up on the Jubilee, I recommend Umane Vitae Study Guide. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Well, you're an important part of our EWTN family, and during our show today, we would love to hear from you. So if you have a question for Kevin or Lisa Cotter, we want you to give us a jingle at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling and you're outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205 271 2980. And you can always send us an email during the show, Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. And hopefully we can use your question or your comment right here on the air. Well, we have a great show today, but before we speak to Kevin and Lisa, we're going to go straight to Washington, D.C. to hear from beautiful Catherine Zeltner, who is the host of EWTN Pro Life Weekly. Catherine, what's the pro life news for this week for us? Hello from Washington, D.C., Jim and Joy. I'm really excited for this week's show. We're airing a special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, looking back at some of our favorite stories. Stories like a former abortionist who became a pro-life OBGYN, an abortion survivor who tells us about her meeting with her birth mother, and former Republican presidential candidate Carly Fiorina opens up about why she is pro-life. And if you want to find out how to get involved in the pro-life movement today, go to ProLifeWeekly.com. That's ProLifeWeekly.com. I hope you'll join us for this special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly as we highlight pro-life heroes. It's tonight, Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern and again on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Now, back to you at home. Thank you, Catherine, and we're praying for Catherine. Catherine is getting married soon, and uh, we're excited for that. It's not a Everybody knows that she announced it. Okay, I was yeah. glad. I wasn't sure <laughs> no. about that. I was like, whoa, no. live Everybody's TV. talking. No, okay. yeah. So just keep Catherine in your prayers. Uh, well, right now, we're going to bring to you beautiful Kevin and Lisa. They come all the way from Denver, Colorado. They're Catholic authors and speakers, podcasters. They're parents. They're real, live human beings. And what they have is what God has given them in their hearts is a great love for a portion of our humanity that really needs to be told the truth in love and to help them to say, you can do this. You were made for more. We don't have to settle for all of the toxic solutions that the culture is throwing at us. So you don't want to miss this wonderful conversation. Well, welcome to the both of you. And Thank we're excited you. to have you. you. We want you first to tell our family at home a little bit about Kevin and Lisa, how we met, where we were born and raised, and your beautiful story. Fantastic. We were both born and raised in Kansas City and grew up there. We're cradle Catholics. Um, we actually got to know each other a little bit in high school. We didn't live too far away okay. from one another and uh, ended up at the same college, Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. Did you know you were doing that together or you just cho you chose separately? 
Uh, well, Kevin transferred into Benedictine. Okay. That's correct, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we actually met at a Catholic summer camp. We we're okay. counselors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. so eventually, I transferred to Benedictine College, mm -hmm. and we we're both students there, involved with Focus, the Fellowship of Catholic University students. As students, shortly after mm -hmm. college, got married. I went off to graduate school uh, there with Lisa, mm -hmm. and then uh, after graduate school, joined Focus to be uh, a Focus missionary family. Perfect. Perfect. And, and we're in three children? We have mm -hmm. three kids, yes. Yep, 11, 9, and 4. Okay. Perfect. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Those yeah. are great ages. Yeah. So how do, how do you like living in Colorado, leaving family, all of your families in Kansas? Well, actually, my sister lives in Colorado with us, okay. which was just happen chance, and mm -hmm. we just feel so blessed. And then Kevin's sister's moving out to Colorado this summer. So, okay, okay. yeah, so it's, yeah. Kansas City will always be home, but we do have a great Focus community there because mm -hmm. that's where Focus is kind right. of headquarters are. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of friends yes. and neighbors. We all intentionally moved near each other, so it's neat. Perfect. Yeah. Well, let's unpack part of the work that you're doing, which is working with young people, college mm -hmm. age or so, and you're finding more and more college students that are coming into a deeper faith. Mm -hmm. but yet bringing baggage with them about a different lifestyle that they mm -hmm. led, especially in the area of sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, and so they come into to this conversion, if I'm understanding your book you know, correctly. Yeah. And yet, just because you come into a deeper conversion to the Lord, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be sound in the sexuality, the chastity area. Mm -hmm. So tell us about this, why you wrote a whole book about it, what you're finding among the young people who you love so much. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, with working with college students, one thing that we kept seeing over and over again is we would tell them about the theology of the body, we would tell them about their worth and their value and their dignity, and they would really want it, but they had no idea how to do it. Mm -hmm. And so they'd get discouraged, because they would understand, okay, I'm worth more, I know that my, my body is sacred, I know that God has a plan for me, but I don't know how to stop living the lifestyle that I've been living. Mm -hmm. And so the idea behind the book is it's a process book, it's 40 days, and we really wanted to help them walk through the practicals, that how do we do it, how do we get from from desiring this beautiful thing that we, we understand and we desire in our heart to being able to actually live it. Right. So they, they're coming into a conversion. You mentioned the theology of the body, John Paul mm -hmm. II's teaching. We mentioned at the beginning of the show, Umani Vitae by Paul VI. Mm -hmm. If you've not read these documents, you really need to, to read them. You can find them on EW10.com and just put in a document and you can find them there. Mm -hmm. um, so they're getting in touch with the teaching, the moral teaching of the church, what it means to be a human person, to have authentic relationships. And just because right. they were baptized Catholic, maybe even grew up in the church, doesn't mean that they were doing that. There's a lot mm -hmm. of us that, that have that story, but they come into this, wow, this is what my faith is about. So you're, they know this, but yet there's another step. It's not enough that you know it's not enough that they want to, they have to live that. Mm -hmm. And so wanting isn't living, maybe an important step, the emotion, the desire, right. mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean you're gonna live it. And you're finding that there's a lot of young people at this conversion still don't live it. Yeah. Your yeah. book's about how to. Yes. That's right. Yeah, yeah and the, the book's called Dating Detox, and we think about just that word detox and this perfecting love in an imperfect world. We live in a culture that really gives us a wrong view of what it means to love and be loved. And so as these young people come alive in Christ, they want Jesus in their life, but they've just had a distorted view of what love looks like, whether it be on the media, whether it be in their own families, whether it be in the relationships they've had in high school or college. And so really we have to walk people through, how do I get those toxins? Just like I might go through um, you know, rehab from alcohol, or, or maybe I go through a, a particular diet to try to get those toxins out of my life, yeah. out of my body, out of my system, the same is true for love, and yes. um, whenever we speak, when we ask crowds, you know, who thinks we have a toxic dating culture? Every, Every hand mm -hmm. goes up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no one in our society that looks at this topic and says, boy, as a culture, we, we have this down. We're you know so what we're good. Doing. We are good. Yeah. 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 Whether you're religious or secular, you know there's a deep, enduring problem in our world around this issue of sexuality and love, and so uh, this, this detox resonates with people of, yeah, I, I need to do something different because what the world offers is not working in my yeah. life. I think the word detox is helpful. I mean, the toxins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's no one that could hear my voice that is not involved in some capacity because we are sexual as a part of our being mm -hmm. who doesn't have experience in this area and mm -hmm. who lives chastely 24 hours a day every moment. Hopefully we do, but maybe we don't. 
and the grip of these, maybe it's a strong word, perversions regarding human relationships, mm -hmm. they're strong, powerful, and we've given into them, whether knowingly, rebelliously, or not knowing, and just going into them. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of that song now, You Really Got a Hold On Me, You Really Got a Hold mm -hmm. On Me, and that's yeah. what it is. You, know, you, know, you really got a hold on me. I, mm -hmm. I, this yes. relationship or pornography or whatever it might be, usury, mm -hmm. using people, it, it gets a hold on you. If you've ever tried to break free in any aspect of a violation of chastity, it is a war, it is a battle, you need to detox. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what are you finding when these young people come to you and they're fairly earnest about, you know, I've made this decision for the Lord and for the church, yet I got all these pulls. You know, the things I want to do, I can't do. The things I don't want to do, I'm still doing. I yes. thought, wow, I had this conversion and like, what Jesus they, was going to fix all what, that. What are they yeah, coming right? to you mm -hmm. with? Mm -hmm. What are they saying? Yeah, a lot of What's them, the struggle? Yeah, the struggle is for a lot of them. There's a lot of guilt and shame that's mm. that's deep in their hearts, and they they have this feeling of I don't deserve to be loved. I don't know how to love. I don't have the ability. There's especially for the guys. They're like, I'm not capable of this. I've tried, and and I can't. I just fail over and over again. So there's really this deep sense of guilt and shame, and it keeps them from trying to take the next step, and yeah. it keeps them in that sin, and they that. The devil just whispers that to them. You can't do this. You're mm -hmm. not enough. It's not going to work. Why are you even trying? Just go with the good enough, which is where a lot of them settle. You know, like, I know it's not perfect, but it's this or be lonely, I guess. And, and so they think that that's the only option. And so what we want to offer is, is some hope that it doesn't have to be like this. You don't have to stay in this. You can overcome those feelings of guilt, those feelings of shame, that, that's your past, it doesn't have to define you. Um, and we walk them through, you know, there's a lot of spiritual healing that has to go on, a lot of emotional healing that has to go on as part of the process, and yeah. along with learning the practical, how do yeah. we do this in, in real life. Um, yeah. And they want it, they do want it, they just need a, they need a guide. Yeah. <laughs> they need a map that's gonna yeah. help them get there and get out of it. Yeah. I think, you know, what we find in, at our center too is in the church and out of the church, Nobody's calling me out of it. Hmm. And the church isn't preaching about it mm -hmm. enough. Uh, enough. People who show up for engaged encounter, everybody's living together. Everybody's mm -hmm. supposed, you know, we're supposed to not, but we're not. So nobody is challenging us or calling us out of it mm -hmm. and saying, this is a toxic thing. It's just kind of like, you know, uh, the ship's going down and we're just setting up the chairs on the mm -hmm. ship. Like, we're okay, we're okay, and we're not okay. Mm -hmm. So how, how do... How do you get the church, I mean, other focus and calling us out in EWTN and calling us to live higher and better? Uh, what, what's happening in the pews and with pastors on this subject? Yeah, well, I think um, that's a lot of our work with focus as having missionaries on campuses. And the way we're effective, I think, is when you take young people, recent college graduates, and you put them out on the campus and they make a stand for their faith and they say, I love Jesus Christ and I love his church. And I want to live my life based on those two ideas. And then we see college students rise up to that challenge and say, oh my gosh, it's possible. And we've tried to take that same concept with our book. Uh, almost every single chapter has a story from a, a Focus missionary who went through a lot of struggles with chastity prior to their time with Focus. And so those stories really help people realize that hope, realize that possibility that, oh my gosh, this person who's on my campus, who's living out their faith in a dynamic way, they struggled. And, and as you read through the book, they're not just small struggles. Many of them are, are very large. They're very huge things to try to overcome. But they did it through our Lord and really pursuing this. And so it's a, it's a great way to bring hope is just those stories to see, you know, as we've talked about families and couples who live out the teachings of the church. That's what allows people to say, okay, it is possible. It's not just a dream. It's not a theory. It's not a concept. This is reality. And it's not a burden. It brings happiness. It brings life. It yeah. brings joy. And freedom. And freedom, yes. <laughs> that, I mean, that's yes. ultimately what we're all wanting. Everyone wants to be yeah. free from ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think a lot of times, too, in the church, sometimes I, I, I think we don't believe enough in our young people, and we think, oh, well, if I, if I give them the truth, it's too hard, and they're going to reject it, and they're not going to like it. But... It, We've found that when you present, even if it's hard, people actually rise to the occasion. They want the truth. They want to hear that. And oftentimes they come to us and they say, where was this when I was in junior high? Right. Where was this when I was in high school? Why didn't anybody tell me that this was going to 
destroy me emotionally and, and make my relationships difficult. And so I think sometimes we are afraid to talk as a church about these things because we, we don't want to ruffle feathers. We don't want anyone to be, you know, hurt. We don't want anybody we to feel wanna, bad. Yeah, we don't make them feel bad. Mm -hmm. But then they come to us later mm -hmm. and they go, could you have made me feel bad? Because it would have helped. <laughs> like, I, I could have made better decisions earlier on and not had all this baggage to yeah. bring. Mm -hmm. But your point as well is even once they hear mm -hmm. through the church or through a parachurch ministry like mm -hmm. focus and so on, mm -hmm. they still can't quite help themselves and they don't know the tools or the powers that are there right. to, to really walk this thing out. Um, you mentioned earlier guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. So these are people coming to you that have asked forgiveness now because they're coming into renewal. Mm -hmm. And isn't it amazing that we can find forgiveness and yet not freedom from guilt and shame? Mm -hmm. And this is something that I found with mm -hmm. good people trying to come out of things mm -hmm. and they've gone to the priest and have confessed it, mm -hmm. which is probably the most important thing because that really is forgiven but they're not quite set free. There's something else that has to take place. And I've see, mm -hmm. seen again and again in speaking with people that they're still inhibited and limping along, mm -hmm. yet they know they're forgiven, but it's that guilt and shame. And at one time they may have said, well, the church is so legalistic, but now they've mm -hmm. received forgiveness and they're the ones that are legalistic. Mm. They won't let themselves off. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're dealing mm -hmm. with guilt and shame that God would never put on them. Can yep. you speak to that and how you help them to be free from this limited or warped understanding, God also wants to deal with your guilt and shame mm -hmm. or other aspects to this. Yeah, I think How do you guide them along and nurture them? Yeah, I think a part of it is helping them understand that there's a healing process. It's not just a one time, you know, I just don't go to confession and it's done. Um, but for many of them, it's, it's a continual, today, Lord, I say yes to your healing me. And today, Lord, yes, I'm gonna give this over to you. And sometimes that takes a long time. Um, one of the, the ladies that I talked to in the interview process when she was talking about how she let go of the guilt and the shame. And she said for her, she found that, you know, Jesus is the divine physician and he wants to heal us. He wants to take those, those feelings away from us. But sometimes if, if he were to come in and fix it all at once, it could overwhelm us. And sometimes he knows the process that he needs to take and he knows as the divine physician, yeah. the exact course of healing that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. So she says, so I just go to him every day as the divine physician and right. say, Lord, heal what you can in me today. And you know the process. So it's just continually yes. being open to that process yeah. of letting go of those yeah. things and realizing it's okay if it's yeah. not all at once, right. Um, right. but to not give up on it. Yeah, and you've done so much work. You've got a number of books on Pope Francis, sure. who mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, all of John Paul II and Benedict II, but Francis in a special way is, has brought forth that mercy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think understanding <clears throat> for me personally, that mercy is not only the covering you know, of our sin and forgiveness atonement, but that mercy is the Lord entering into an ongoing struggle that you're having and, and taking hold of you yeah. Uh, it, it's his heart in misery for your miseries. And this is an ongoing process and it might always be there. There might always be a thorn in your side. Mm -hmm. And like, like, why is that still there? Aren't I forgiven? You're forgiven, but there's still temptation or struggle or weakness or woundedness that you have. Mm -hmm. And that, speak to that about God's mercy being with us day to day and in the things that we feel so contaminated by, we don't love ourselves and he's there. Yeah, Pope Francis talks about how it's not God who tires of forgiving us, it's us who tire of asking God for forgiveness. And I think that process really speaks loudly into that. You know, at our focus conferences, we see just an amazing, amazing amount of young people come to the Lord. We have Eucharistic adoration, we have amazing talks, and then it's really the highlight of the conferences see the vast majority of these young people, thousands and thousands of young people go to confession and really have their sins yes. forgiven mm -hmm. with our Lord. And that's such an amazing, beautiful yeah. event. But like we're talking about, how does that keep going? And a little bit what the book is, why it's a process book, is trying to take that moment where they confess their sins, where they realize maybe for the first time, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. this is how I can have the freedom to love and be loved and try to take that process and make it longer so that they realize they just can't, we'd love to just fix it, right? We live right. in a very instantaneous mm -hmm. world where mm -hmm. I made this commitment, I had this thought, shouldn't it just happen? Mm -hmm. But the Lord in his mercy and the Lord in his kindness actually works with us over time and gradually, and so that's why it's really the 40 days, obviously it's 
it can be more than that as right. well. But to give us that time to continue to go back to the Lord and examine our lives yeah. even further and to ask the Lord for even more mercy and grace, that's what's gonna that's what's gonna do it. It doesn't just all happen all at once. Well let's let's pause at this point. It's Kevin and Lisa Carter, Catholic authors and speakers. Uh, the name of the book is Dating Detox, 40 Days of Perfecting Love in an Imperfect World. It's a holy, beautiful conversation. Hopefully it's a help to you, to your loved ones. Join the conversation. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. to be a part of this show. So if you're at home and you're listening to Kevin and Lisa and you're thinking, you know, I've messed up, I've made some bad life choices, and you're suffering consequences of that, maybe broken relationships, a wounded soul, a hole in your soul that you just can't fix, we want you to give us a jingle so you can actually talk with Kevin and Lisa at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling and you're outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we can use your question or your comment right here on the air. Well, Lisa and Kevin, in reading your book and sharing with you and thinking about, you know, what's the antidote to this or what are the steps to help people, what are the tools? Mm -hmm. One of the things that's come across in our conversation, it was a phrase you used back in mm -hmm. the green room, was that, um, well, they really don't know why they're doing what they're doing. And until we know why we're doing what we're doing and the bad result, and we keep going back to it again and again. We keep repeating it. How do you bring them to this place? Or how do they come to the place of wanting to look at the patterns in their lives, the bad habits in their lives that they may not even be aware of, or mm -hmm. their unruly desires, emotion gone crazy? Mm -hmm. What do you see with this? How do you bring them to that? Or did they just come to it? Did you point it out to them? That, that whole thing of not knowing why I'm doing what I'm doing and repeating the same thing, getting the same bad result, feeling terrible with guilt and shame, but I keep going back to this. But I want to do better. I mean, it's a form of like <laughs> yeah. insanity, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think that's why a lot of people pick up the book is they find themselves in that situation where they go, I've not done this once, I've not done this twice, I've done this over and over, and I'm, I'm just sick of it. I don't, I don't want what the culture has to offer. I've experienced that multiple times in many different ways and it doesn't fulfill me, it doesn't bring me happiness. And so when you walk people through a process, when you give them time to actually think about their lives, right? Not everything's so instantaneous. Yeah. In, the, in the moment, like so many of our young people are, it's just right in the moment. But have them sit in silence and think, all right, why is my life the way it is? Why did I make that decision? Really kind of start to scratch after what's going on and why is that happening? And that's where the book starts to really, really mm -hmm. bring that out. And we do it in a really practical way. We have them work on identifying what we call triggers, or you could call it cue, but something that sets them up for those situations. So one of the interviews we did, I was talking with a girl and she said, you know, I kept going over to my ex-boyfriend's house and every time I would go over there, something would happen. And I would go home crying because I did it again and I didn't want to do it. She did, and I don't know why it took me forever to realize I can't go to his house. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's- Parents could have told her that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They probably did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When that was, but, but she really didn't get yeah, it. She just didn't make that connection. This is what the process. We're mm -hmm. in a house, we're alone. Yes, yes. we were and, alone. And, you know, it's the other, you know, we got grandkids now going off to college and so on. And, their parents, our kids, you know, and in-laws are doing a great job with them and, you know, they're making commitment, but we're not going to be promiscuous and we're not going to whatever. And I've, I said to one of them recently, I said, you know, you can meet a good Christian boy or Catholic boy and not be promiscuous with a lot of, but just be lonely and be alone and something can happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. You know, like she's a good yeah. girl and mm -hmm. you're a good boy. And then all of a sudden, 
So go Nobody into that. meant for that that's, to that's happen. That's the trick, right? right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we spend a lot of time help, helping them work on identifying what is it that sets me up for these situations that I regret. Critical. Mm -hmm. and, and be aware of that. And so in some cases, it's well, you need to start avoiding those things. For a lot of them, alcohol mm -hmm. is a huge trigger. Um, and maybe it's a certain location or a certain time of day where they notice that's when they start to struggle or fall. And so starting to come up with plans, okay, so what are we going to do when it's that time of day? If I know I get lonely in the evenings by myself, well, then you need to have a friend who's going to know I'm struggling with this. Will you come over and hang out with me at this time of day? And right. we're going to we're going to play cards or we're going to study or, you know, just help me get through this time. Or uh, if you know that if you go to that party, something's going to happen, then you need to make different plans on Friday night, not go yeah. to the party and just will yourself yeah. to not make right. a mistake because mm -hmm. it's yeah. not that easy. Well, yeah, because it defeats you. Well, mm -hmm. we're going to go straight to the phone. Mary, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Kevin or Lisa. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, isn't part of the problem today the way that uh, the amount of stress is with so many people? Um, I just think that's part of the problem, why men look at women as sex objects instead of looking at it as a person. Thank you so much for your comment and your question. You deal a lot with this because I, I got, mm -hmm. you know, usury, you know, mm -hmm. it's is that where this is going to? Not an authentic relationship of sacrifice, but usury. Mm -hmm. People are objects. Mm -hmm. They make them objects for my pleasure. Yeah. Well, I think, and she was mentioning people are stressed, and there's a lot of stress involved. And I think a lot of times we let ourselves get so emotionally bankrupt because we live in such a fast-paced, go, 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 achieve, don't fail kind of a world. And I think um, social media even plays into that because our teens, you know, they're constantly watching each other and thinking, you know, I better be more, do more, I'm not enough. And, and so they, they run themselves to a place of emotional bankruptcy. And so then they are grasping for love because they're so depleted. And so they allow themselves to get in a situation where they're using people or being used because they yeah. just want love. They just yeah. want something to fill the emptiness that's yeah. been brought on from yeah. such a, a constant fatigue and right. stress of life. Yeah. And then... We find again and again in our pro-life center, when we have women coming to us, 40% of whom who think we're an abortion center. Mm. Um, mm. And a lot of times the discussion comes up, but he loves me, or I love him. And, and we just find that we have to ask the question, when you say love, what do you mean? Mm. Yeah. Just, when you say love, what do you mean? When you say abortion, what do you mean by abortion? Mm -hmm. and, and when you say Jesus Christ, what do you mean? When you say you're Catholic, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we got to clarify. So there's so much talk about love, but they're thinking you know, differently than what the element really of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the whole thing of, well, I thought that was love, but it's really not, because it's not this usury. It's not how it, you find fulfillment by serving other people, by mm -hmm. wanting what's right, by moving towards the highest good, the most virtuous thing in somebody's mm -hmm. life. Who's having those conversations? Right. Yeah. Except, you know, you're having them, hopefully parents are having them, the church is speaking this, mm -hmm. but they don't hear this and see it model. How are they going to know? Yeah. And I think in our culture, everything seems to be for our comfort, right? So social media, I want instant entertainment. If I want to order something, I, I go on Amazon and just one click, I can have something delivered to me very quickly. Uh, there's always a quick solution to satisfy me. And so when we come to relationships, we often bring that same perspective right there and so we, we end up looking at people, like she said, as objects that are there to just satisfy me. And so when that relationship is no longer satisfying, it's no longer helpful, then just like a product, just like a social media person I follow, I'll just get rid of it. And so we really have to shape people's minds and help transform, detox their minds from this attitude that everything's just for me, but no, I'm actually a gift to, to yeah. love other people. And that's ultimately the, the best way forward to, to yeah. have that mind flipped. Yeah. I'm, I met with a beautiful young couple this morning and I actually had to say, this is a lamp. Mm. This is an object. We use the object, but we mm -hmm. don't use her. Mm -hmm. And he like looked at me like what I just said. Yeah. You know, and, and so you really do. And mm -hmm. it, it is one conversation of time because so many people are deceived mm -hmm. that I could use that. And when I'm done using you, even if I impregnated you and you had my baby out of wedlock, I'm done, I go. Because mm -hmm. it's not good for me anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know, the question was, uh, mm -hmm. what about the stress? Well, we have to temper our passions. Mm -hmm. We're not animals. We're not. 
We're human beings made in the image and likeness of God, and we have power, mm -hmm. and we have to temper. I don't get to say things that are going to be hurtful. You have to temper your language. You have to temper your emotions, and no, we don't temper anything anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, oh, that's how, she, that's how she is. Mm -hmm. well, we don't get to be the fool because that's how you are. You yeah. know, we have to train and disciple and mentor and... Yes. Speak about yes. that. Training, mentoring, discipling, habits, developing habits, because whoever you're dealing with, they've developed habits, like they might be athletes, and they got that down totally. When they get up, how they work out, what they eat, what they don't eat. Yet we're living these unauthentic relationships and violations of everything. So they can be disciplined, but we just don't mm -hmm. get that there's a discipline that goes with living a Catholic life. Mm -hmm. How do you speak to them about that? What are you doing? Do you speak about habits and mm -hmm. what virtue is and developing that? How do you oh, yeah. That? Yeah, we definitely do. That, that within the first week of the book, we start talking about what is virtue? How do we build these good habits, these habits, you know, the habitual dispositions to choose the greater good? And we, we make sure, too, I think people don't understand themselves that they have a will. <laughs> They have the ability to choose, you know, and and so from the very beginning of the book, we talk about, you know, you have an intellect that can discern what is right through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and you have a will that can choose to do that good, and um, so yeah, we have um, just some uh, like formation pieces that need to be laid. Yeah. Um, that a lot of people have never heard mm -hmm. before and they just think well I'm an animal I just right. this is what I do this is natural and normal and and in some sense yes it's natural and normal but it has to be directed and guided yeah. by your intellect and your will yeah. that you've been given which separates you from the animals and whether it's this area regarding sexuality and the emotions mm -hmm. or other areas that our emotions are moving towards sometimes people feel I'm not being authentic if I don't act on these I'm a hypocrite mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like, no, like your emotions are your emotions and are moving you in various ways. But you need to know the other players on the team within you and the intellect and the will are to govern these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's an insight. I didn't know that, you know, growing up. And so when, once you know those priorities, you can say, well, I guess these can be stronger over this. Mm -hmm. It's not that the emotions are bad, but they can't be in this right. lead position. They're not the quarterback, right? Mm -hmm. They're in another position. Mm -hmm. That's news. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's shocking <laughs> news to them. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very interesting to see those light bulbs go off, and it's freeing because it's like, oh, oh, I don't have to just follow my passions. I can actually guide them, and I I, I think it's important too. One thing that is so important for them to understand too is that you know these these emotions, these passions, they happen to us, and that's not that that's what just it happens to us. But right. that's not a, that's not it's morally neutral. What matters is what are we going to do with it. How are we going to respond to that desire that happens to us? It's not wrong or bad to feel a certain way necessarily, but we can begin to guide our passions so that way it's choosing our passions start to desire what's good. And that's what the book can help you do. Amen. Yeah, I mean, I might say that I'd love to eat donuts for every single meal. And he would. Every single day, and I yeah. could. Yeah. All right, that's, that that, that's, <laughs> that's my passions, but my, my intellect says, you know, if you eat donuts, you'd probably feel pretty terrible, and it wouldn't be good for you whatsoever. And so my will makes a decision. And I think the same thing is once we start to realize these light bulb moments go off, realize what their own sexuality, yeah. we had these passions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what are we going to do with them? Amen. What decisions are we going to make? Let's invite uh, Lorraine from New Jersey on the phone. Your question or your comment. Go right ahead. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, so my daughter, um, when she was 17, was in a very toxic relationship. And um, now she's married. And she acknowledges that she was in this toxic relationship. Um, and she suffers for it now. Um, she just has difficulty in the marriage, and she has. She acknowledges that she has to be healed of this, but she doesn't want to talk about it. It's just something she wants to kind of uh, brush under the rug. And I wondered if this book or another book or or any advice you could give me to help her. She's she's really not a practicing Catholic um, now, but um, I would appreciate um, any help mm -hmm. that you could give me. Thank you for your question and comments, and we will pray for your daughter at the conclusion of this show. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and the first thing that comes to my mind is actually Crystalina Everett's ministry, Women Made New. Um, they have, she has some great resources there um, that just talk about the importance of healing and how those wounds, they will carry into marriage if we don't take care yeah. of them. And it, the ultimate thing she really does need to do is to face it and yeah. to deal with it and call it out by name and recognize what happened yeah. and how it's affecting her. And that can be really difficult. Um, but I, I, my greatest suggestion would be trying to get her to a counselor or just somebody mm -hmm. who can spiritually walk her through, a spiritual director. I know she's not Catholic, but some kind of an equivalent to that. Yeah. who can help her process through those things because yeah. it will continue to just be be a weight, be an anchor around her if she doesn't begin to work with it. Um, yeah. Our book is more specifically for singles. We have had married couples read it together and say it brought out some great conversation and it brought out some great um, re recognition of things that had gone on in the past that we had not addressed previously. But I think it's so important to recognize just because you get married, it's not just poof, it's all gone, everything's better. Right. And I said, I do, and I love him so much, and yeah. now it's all good. We used to do premarital counseling, and you know, we would do that for so six good. months, and we'd meet with a couple, and then we would always do, um, we always met with them afterwards, yeah. and um, yeah. mm -hmm. so they'd come back, and I'd say, hey, mm -hmm. how's it going? And she'd be like, I can't stand him. <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, now you're married. Because, you, know? you know, it's just we all have this illusion of what we think it is. Mm -hmm. And we're married 40 years, and I am madly in love with Jim. But it's work. Mm -hmm. I mean, and if you want a good marriage, you, you have to work at it. You have to work at communicating. Mm -hmm. You have to work at dying to yourself. Yes. You know, you have to prefer the other. I mean, that just is like, that doesn't come easy for any human being. You know, mm -hmm. we all want, well, I don't want that, you know, and I want that now, you know. And so we have to work that out and die to ourselves. Speak to us about the importance of community for us all, but especially for these young people that, you know, I'm not alone in this. You know, the support of a community, accountability, and also the power of the sacraments. You mm. know, once they really understand not only what a sacrament is, but who he is in the sacrament. How important are these areas? Community, sacramental life. Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, community is essential to live in an age where not only are they not seeing how to love and be loved among their peers, many young people haven't seen it in their own families or their extended families. What they see is divorce, what they see is separation, what they see is even in married family situations use. They haven't seen what true love looks like. And so to have someone come alongside them to have a, a married couple in their life or someone who's engaged or even just a good dating couple yeah. just means the world to them of, oh my gosh, it's possible. This can actually be done. And so when we add accountability, whether it's someone who's yeah. along the line or just someone who's with them right by their side and saying, I'm going to do this with you. And how are things going? And I know your triggers and you know mine and you can follow up with questions and you can ask me and we can really check in. And if things go wrong, then we're going to brainstorm together. We're going to figure out how do we get out of that situation? How do we get out of those circumstances and create new habits so that we can really have this freedom? And it's, it's essential. You need someone, you need a band of brothers, you know, squad of sisters, whatever it might be, to really be with you as you're going through this process, as you go through the highs and especially the lows to, to carry you through. I think, it too, it helps you not get to the point of emotional bankruptcy because you're feeling human interaction and you're getting connection and you're having real mm. relationships. And so you're not grasping for love in other places because you're so lonely. Right. And so for so many of the people we talked to, those two things you mentioned, community was one that was just paramount. It was huge. Everybody needed to have a strong community to enter into. And then the sacraments, too, um, was really number two because same thing, you're not as emotionally bankrupt when you are allowing God to touch you, which is yeah. what the sacraments do. It's where God can come and touch us through confession, through the Eucharist. He's with us. And so we don't get to the mm. point where we're just so lonely because we're filled up. And so the sacraments was huge. People um, often would tell us, you know, I just had to go sit in adoration. I just, I couldn't, I didn't know how to process. I didn't know where else to go. I didn't know what yeah. else to do. And so I just yeah. had to go be with somebody and the most important somebody to be with was their Lord. Let's pause at that point, having a blessed conversation with Kevin and Lisa Carter, the name of the book, Dating Detox. And uh, Jesus has everything we need to break free and to have authentic human relationships, to be in touch with the past, but don't live in it. Be in touch with now and set your face towards the great future God has for you. We'll be right back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. Well, you're an important part of our EWTN family, and you can join us live right here on At Home. And you can be a member of our studio audience, and we would love to have you. Today, we have people from all over. All you need to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department. Send them an email, pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Give them a jingle, 205-271. 2966. Come to Irondale, Alabama. We certainly would love to have you. You can take a tour of the network. would be beautiful. Go to Hansville to Mother Angelica's resting place and just have a delightful time. And by the way, it's sunny and lovely today here in Birmingham. Well, right now we're going to go straight to Rome to hear from Joan. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings from my home in Rome to all of you at home on a big news day. In fact, yesterday, today, and as you'll hear in a moment, um, tomorrow. Now today and tomorrow, senior law enforcement officials and bishops, men and women religious, men and women lay people, important international organizations, are all meeting in the Vatican for the fifth Santa Marta group meeting. Now this is a group of people that studies practices on how to fight human trafficking and slavery. They look at the best methods to do this throughout the world. Now Pope Francis will meet them tomorrow, Friday, and the group includes several cardinals, including Cardinal Vincent Nichols of Westminster, because he actually heads the group. Now what's important is that today is the World Day of Prayer and Reflection on Human Trafficking, and it is also the liturgical feast day of St. Josephine Bakhita. If you remember, she was a Sudanese nun who herself was the victim of human trafficking. Now, yesterday at the general audience, the Holy Father referred to this day of prayer and reflection, and he said, having few possibilities of regular channels, many migrants are forced to choose illegal channels of migration where they are eventually submitted to terrible abuses, to exploitation, and to even slavery. And the Pope then invited, quote, everyone, individuals and institutions, to join forces to prevent human trafficking and also to assure these victims of protection and assistance. And then the Pope said, let us pray that the Lord may convert the hearts of traffickers and give hope to those who are the victims of this terrible abuse that they might eventually regain their freedom. Now also at the audience yesterday, another important event, the Holy Father noted that tomorrow, Friday, open the 23rd Winter Olympic Games in Pyeongchang, South Korea. And importantly, he said, the traditional Olympic truce takes on a particular significance since delegations from both North and South Korea will be marching together in the opening celebration and will also be competing together as one team. And Francis said, this makes us hope for a world in which conflicts can be peacefully resolved through dialogue and through mutual respect, because both of these, of course, are the values that sports uh, embody. So very important events today, coming up tomorrow, but time's up as usual. So back to you at home. Joan, thank you so much for another wonderful report. And sharing with us how our Father stands so clearly on the side of mercy and justice and the defense of the weak, especially with human trafficking. Thank you for your work there. Well, beautiful couple, what do you want to share with us now, just in terms of your great work? Yeah, we, we cannot forget we need to say hi to our kids. So um, <laughs> You need to do that's that. That's very important. Your so Mary Claire, Paul, and Grace, that's we right. love you. <laughs> who's watching your children? And who's watching your children at your uh, here? My dad. So <laughs> dad, thanks for watching our kids so we can yes, be down here. This is fantastic. Right. Hero Grandpa is that's at right. home. We so. need our grandparents. Well, you're doing great yeah. work in this whole area of chastity and detoxing from false relationships. How can people reach you? What do you have going on yes. that they can get involved with? Yeah, yeah. Um, madetomagnify.com is my website. Um, one thing we're really excited about with the book is Lent is coming up very soon in a week here, and we are doing a Instagram uh, group. So there's a closed Instagram group that you can ask to join, and Kevin and I are going to be getting on most days and mm -hmm. doing some videos and putting in relation to the book. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we'll walk with you through the 40 days. So it's perfect to do during Lent because it's Lent's 40 days. The book's mm -hmm. 40 days, and yes. so each day we'll be on to kind of walk through. What a through. great opportunity! I mean, how many people? Yeah. You know, what do you want to do for Lent? I want to be totally set free and given to authentic relationships. I need some help doing that. You got the book, mm -hmm. you can connect. Uh, yep. 
We'll yeah. be hanging out there. Electronically, fantastic. Yeah, and if you go, it's so great. I think with one, it's like, what am I going to do? What am I going to give up? The book, just just read the book each day, and it provides different challenges. So it's really, mm -hmm. it's not just I'm going to read the book each day during Lent, but all right, I'm going to be challenged. There's going to be things I'm going to have to give up. So it's really amazing if you join that group as well. Then, yeah, you get mm -hmm. behind the scenes, really awesome videos from us. And then a community of people are going through it online. So yeah. then as people are asking questions, we're answering them, and we're kind of going through that experience together through Lent and learning uh, yeah. that freedom to love and be loved. Yeah. And, and you know, the yeah. beauty of the holiness of our journey, every Lenten journey, is that we come out of Lent better human beings than when we went in, mm -hmm. and that we are more like Jesus and less of us, no matter what it is, if it's detoxing or w whatever our encounter that God's calling us to. So it's not just like, okay, yeah, I did Lent 2018. Well, what was it? Mm -hmm. Did you, did you, were you transformed? Were you renewed? Were you empowered? Who did you journey with and what did it look like? What a beautiful opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the hope. Well, thank you so much for being with us, yeah. Dating Detox and uh, Authentic Relationships. You're a beautiful example of that. You've really given people hope today, mm. and not only hope, but a way to make this a reality in their lives. God bless you and your ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Hope this has been meaningful for you today. We want you to be encouraged, and that nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Yield to Him. Come home to the church. Prepare for Lent. Encounter Jesus Christ himself in the blessed sacraments who'll give you the power you need to overcome. Keep it on EWTN. You're an important part of this family. And you are always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now. <laughs>